One minute, Altiplano was Mexico's most secure prison. The next, well, you know what happened. This is the moment where Joaquin El Chapo Guzman makes the Mexican government look ridiculous. After El Chapo's daring escape, no one expected the Mexican government would ever use the prison for a dangerous criminal ever again. So, why on earth is El Chapo's son Ovidio currently in a cell in Altiplano? Has something changed since the tunnel escape? And if it has, what is it? What's really inside El Chapo's son's prison cell that could keep the younger Guzman from escaping like his father? The history of Altiplano. The maximum security prison cell that El Chapo escaped from in 2015 is not the same maximum security prison that his son Ovidio is currently being held in. I mean, it is still the same Altiplano Max, but things are different. The Mexican authorities learned a lot from the 2015 escape, enough to ensure that the facility lives up to its former reputation as an impenetrable fortress. Because that is exactly what Altiplano was before 2015. In the 1960s through to the 80s, the drug trade was on a steady rise. Drug lords were being convicted every other weekday, and prisons were overflowing. But that wasn't what inspired the construction of Altiplano. The need for maximum security only became apparent after prison breaks became a norm. The assaults came from the outside and they were brazen, with most of them happening in broad daylight. By 1988, the Mexican government had had enough. Under the president of Mexico at the time, Carlos Salinas de Gortari, Altiplano was commissioned Federal Social Readaptation Center No. 1. By 1990, it was complete, and by November 91, Altiplano received its first set of inmates. Now this is where most people get it wrong. Before El Chapo, Altiplano lived up to its name. From a structural perspective, it was impenetrable. Its walls were reinforced to as much as 3.3 feet thick, which is about one meter to our metric friends. This level of reinforcement was purposely done to prevent jailbreakers from ramming the walls. Then, they restricted the airspace above the facility. It became a no-fly zone to discourage any aircraft from swooping in to aid and escape. Finally, cell phone transmissions were throttled in the vicinity to just 14 kilometers, so that even if an inmate smuggled a phone in, they wouldn't have much luck communicating with their colleagues on the outside. For extra measures, armored personnel were stationed near the facility to intercept any external assaults. From 1990 to 2015, everyone was focused on the wrong side of the one meter thick wall. While they were focused on stopping criminals from breaking in, they had somehow convinced themselves that no one could break out. And as you already know, they were very wrong. But wait, El Chapo might have been a whole different beast. He might have found his way in and out of the facility, but he wasn't the only beast in Altiplano. Before and after him, the facility has and can continues to serve as the home of drug kingpins, who were often more ruthless and more fearsome than the Sinaloa king himself. I'm talking about kingpins like Miguel Felix Gallardo, Hector El Guerra Palma, Omar Trevino Morales, and Servando Gomez Martinez. Servando, also known as La Tuta, was a former leader of the Knights Templar drug cartel. He was a vile man that did things I would get banned for even talking about. Just think of him as a cross between Hannibal Lecter and Escobar. And yes, I'm including that Hannibal lector trait. Omar Trevino Morales was the former leader of the Los Zetas drug cartel. If you know what Los Zetas was about and it was still going strong, then you know Omar needs no introduction. Meanwhile, El Guero was El Chapo's longtime associate before he got nabbed in 95. None of these men ever escaped Altiplano, despite their resources and reputation for violence. However, it was Miguel Felix Gallardo's case that is the most interesting, because not only was he more legendary and more brutal than all the drug lords I just mentioned, he is the only one who gave detailed descriptions of his cell in Altiplano. Gallardo was a Mexican drug lord who ran his country's narcotic circuits around the same time Escobar was at his peak in Colombia. Gallardo was a founding member of the Guadalajara cartel, and El Chapo was his lieutenant at the time. This was back in the 80s. I can drone on all day about this man and the many outlandish atrocities he committed. What you need to know is that Gallardo became so much of a pain in Mexico's side that they did everything they could to keep him behind bars. In 1993, he was captured and immediately sent to Altiplano for a 37-year sentence. And his time in Altiplano Altiplano was filled with nothing but complaints. I mean, prisons are not exactly meant to be five-star experiences, but Altiplano was a special kind of hell for Gallardo. In the maximum security prison, he says his cell was a dingy 8 by 14 foot hole that he was never allowed to leave. Eventually, his health deteriorated to the point where he suffered from vertigo, deafness, loss of an eye, and blood circulation problems. And maybe this is why El Chapo was so keen on escaping Altiplano. A report by human rights observers have cited that most, if not all, prisons in Mexico have
have and currently still have issues with overcrowding, inmate mistreatment, a lack of trained guards, and inadequate sanitary facilities. But Gallardo never escaped Altiplano. He was forced to stay behind bars for over 30 years before he was eventually placed on house arrest in 2022. So now you know why El Chapo's escape was genuinely shocking to almost everyone. And that's because he had help. And I'm not even talking about his goons. He had inside help. Don't believe me? I don't know about you, but something about that sounds off. And think about it. How did someone drill under a federal max into a cell without arousing suspicion? Again, that's a story for another video. Now that we've established Altiplano as a fearsome, almost impenetrable prison, you might be wondering why a video is being sent there. Most people would agree if a video wasn't El Chapo's son, he would be a nobody. I mean, before the arrests, how many times did you hear the name or video in the news? See, no one is arguing the extent of a video's corruption. We just want to be sure that the government isn't punishing the son for the crimes of his father. Hold that thought. If we aren't careful, we might make the same error that the government made. They underestimated Ovidio Guzman Lopez, and boy oh boy, did they pay for it dearly. Black Thursday, Jueves Negro. One of the events that came to define just how dangerous Ovidio really was took place in 2019. El Chapo was already in the US at the time, awaiting what many believed would be a well-deserved extreme sentence in the most extreme prison facility in the world, ADX Florence. The president of Mexico, President Andrés Manuel López Obrador, had just been freshly elected and was bent on finishing off El Chapo's legacy as one of his first acts in office. This meant destroying the Sinaloa cartel and throwing all of his allies in jail. Unfortunately for him, it was a naive proposition from multitude of reasons. The most glaring was the civil war that had erupted in the aftermath of El Chapo's capture. Four of El Chapo's sons, Ivan Archivaldo Guzman Salazar, Jesus Alfredo Guzman Salazar, Joaquin Guzman Lopez, and Ovidio himself had allied themselves under the name Los Chapitos. Los Chapitos were interested in only one thing, the seat of their father. But this was a problem because their father's brother, Aureliano Guzman, known as El Guano, and his business partner, Ishmael Almayo Zambada, had already laid claim to El Chapo's throne. And the two men were not about to hand it over to the Chapitos just because. So what followed was two years of bitter infighting that not only crippled the state of Sinaloa, but caused an international row messy enough to cause concerns for the Mexican presidency. This was the backdrop for President Obrador's decision to take down Los Chapitos and everything connected to the Sinaloa cartel. But there were still several issues. For one, no one knew where El Mayo or El Guano were hiding. So Obrador went for the lowest hanging fruit, Los Chapitos. It was common knowledge that Ovidio was the weakest of the brothers. He was the flash the least capable, and the least protected. Intelligence agencies had always had him on their radar. Heck, the young Chapo even posted pictures of his cartel activities and acquisitions on social media. There was just no incentive to capture him before now. Now, capturing him would be a cakewalk. They were half right. Capturing him was relatively easy. What they didn't anticipate was the violence that would follow when they tried to keep him. His half-brother Archibaldo basically called in all of the reinforcements from all surrounding towns and regions in Sinaloa and it was flooded with a bunch of armed cartel guys. In a sequence of gut-wrenching events that the media has since termed Black Thursday, those cartel sicarios brought the capital city of Culiacan to its knees. The government didn't anticipate the older brothers showing up for their little one. Exits were blocked. Businesses were shut down. Citizens were kidnapped from their homes and assaulted in the streets. The city was paralyzed. It was unprecedented. The world watched as President Obrador dealt with what had become an international incident and a national embarrassment. His hands were now tied. Sure, he had video in custody, and sure, he could easily wipe out the treasonous cartel sicarios with less than a fraction of the national armed forces if he wanted to, but if he did, if he replied to the cartel violence with more violence, the grass would suffer. The collateral damage would be devastating, and citizens would die in their hundreds, if not thousands. It would be political suicide, to say the least. He had played a game of checkers when Los Chapitos were playing three-dimensional chess. The only option on the table was to let Ovidio go. We've decided to protect people's lives and I agreed with that because this is not about causing massacres, that's over with. The capture of one criminal can't be worth more than the lives of citizens. Now, are you beginning to understand why the government had to send Ovidio to Altiplano? No? You still aren't convinced? Well, the events around his next capture should be enough evidence to convince you. The 5th of January 2023, Ovidio was out hiding in a rural fishing community on the outskirts of Culiacan. Pulling no punches, the Mexican government launched an assault on Ovidio's premises like it was D-Day World War II. First, a chopper descended on his residence with machine gun fire. Then, ground 
ground troops engaged Ovidio's men on the ground. Heavy gunfire on both sides lasted for hours. The government prevailed and captured the young Guzman once again. However, reinforcements were coming. Reprisal attacks were about to begin, but the Mexican government was ready to play their own game of chess. An armed government convoy cut through the city of Culiacan headed for a state penitentiary. Immediately, the sicarios gave chase, engaging it in heavy gunfire, assuming it held Ovidio. They were wrong. It was a decoy. Immediately after Ovidio was captured, officials had placed him in a stealth chopper that took him straight to Altiplano. The decoy was just a distraction for his sicarios, because the moment they began chasing the convoy, Mexican armed forces stepped in, took control of the state, and finished off the sicarios. Mission accomplished. Today, Ovidio is sitting in a special unit cell in Altiplano, the most secure prison in Mexico. All the government has to do now is keep him in jail, but how are they sure they can? If Ovidio is anything like his father, then we know it is only a matter of time before he finds a way out, right? Ovidio's Altiplano cell. In the immediate aftermath and the incredible embarrassment of El Chapo's escape, the prison authorities installed new security measures, including additional surveillance cameras, metal detectors, and x-ray machines to prevent the entry of contraband items into the prison. The exterior perimeter was refurbished. Remember that one meter thick wall I told you about? They increased its height, additional watchtowers were added to detect movements around the outer wall, and sensors were installed to catch whomever or whatever the watchtowers might miss. The old prison staff could no longer be trusted, so most of them were laid off, and the ones who weren't were rotated on a new schedule, with new staff who were employed soon after. All staff members were retained under new guidelines that remained confidential for obvious reasons. Visits were revised, contact between visitors and inmates were reduced, and communications received new restrictions. The size of the special units, the kind of cells that El Chapo escaped from, and the one that Ovidio is currently in were revised. The newer version is small and dingy, with a bed, a toilet, a table, and a chair. There are provisions for basic hygiene products. Beyond that, no inmate is allowed to bring any personal belongings. Every cell now features ceiling CCTVs that have no blind spots and are monitored 24-7 by trained guards that track inmate activities around the clock. Routine searches are also conducted, and given Ovidio's family tree, his cell is likely subject to more searches and inspections by prison authorities. This means that any contraband or unauthorized items found in his cell would result in disciplinary action, and potentially further charges. Everything I've mentioned so far is combined with all the other existing restrictive measures we mentioned earlier, but most importantly, no one, not even Ovidio, will ever hope to escape by tunnel. The floors of all top security cells are now reinforced with metal bars and a 16-inch layer of concrete. For the younger Guzman, there will be no digging, there will be no tunnels, there will be no escape. It is game over. Or is it?